This is Live Well Talk on Migraine Headaches. I'm Dr. Dustin Arnold, Chief Medical Officer at Unity Point Health St. Luke's Hospital. Joining me today is Whitney Hankin, a nurse practitioner at St. Luke's Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, who specializes in relief and treatment of migraine headaches. Today we'll discuss signs, symptoms, and phases of migraine headaches, treatment options, and more. Whitney, welcome. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. You know, I, I, I think uh, uh, migraine headaches are difficult to treat if you don't have some expertise and some interest in it. Absolutely. I mean, in general, are a headache to treat. And, it, and it's because you can't see it, you can't x-ray it, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the measurability of it is uh, minimal. But having a wife and a, a daughter that have them, um, they're quite disabled. Very so, much so. Very much so. Could you just start with what, what is a migraine and how common is it? Sure. So uh, migraines are a type of headache, um, a little bit different etiology than just, you know, your, your classic headache. Usually they start on one side. Um, they're pretty predictable pathways. It can be both sides, though. Um, they have... Uh, an intense nature, throbbing quality, usually have some sort of photophobia, you know, sensitivity to light, phonophobia, sensitivity to sound, nausea, vomiting. um, And they usually kind of take you out of commission. A headache, you know, if, if you've ever experienced one, I just found out that there are people out there that have never had a headache, which is just boggles me. Um, but they usually are bilateral, um, less intense, don't have any aura or any associated symptoms, um, and usually can be alleviated with over-the-counter medications. Yeah. So. You know, I'm one of the, I, I'm, I won't say I've never had a headache, but it's very, very rare. You know, You're I just don't, I just, Fortunate enough, I don't get them. You're a lucky man, very much so. Well, I'm a lucky man on very many levels. <laughs> so, what what would be the threshold that someone should receive treatment for a migraine? How, sure. I mean, how frequent do they have to be? You know, and and whether or not they can obtain relief. I always say if it's interrupting your activities of daily life at any point, you could have one every other month. And, you know, if it takes you out of commission, if you have to miss work, I would say treatment is definitely an option for you. Um, There is a difference between acute treatment and chronic treatment. Acute would be 14 migraine days a month or less, and chronic would be 15 or more head pain days per month. Um, when you get into that range where you're having almost daily head pain, even if it's not a migraine, a prophylactic treatment is definitely indicated. Okay. So what is it? I mean, it is my impression, and I don't know this for sure. This is more common in females. Yes. You hear about it more in females, but I do have a lot of patients that are men that come in and they, they complain of a lot of neck pain or you know, like I just get a lot of headaches. I'm never head pain free. And once I start asking them questions, you know, I'm like, I think you're having migraines. And if we use certain treatments that are very, very focused on migraines, they actually get relief. So I think more men suffer from it than, than they think. Um, I have a lot of patients that confuse neck pain and migraines because a lot of times it will start in the neck and work its way up. Um, you know, kind of that tension headache hole that people say, you know, oh, I just have tension headaches. But a lot of times they're having migraine and you just don't realize it. Or in my experience, sometimes people blame uh, sinus headache. Yes. And when it's not a sinus headache, it's not sinus, you know, discomfort. Related at all. So, I mean, I was always under the impression that there's an association with the menstrual cycle and pubescence. And would tell me about that relationship. So sometimes, especially with hormonal changes, menopause, menstrual cycles, um, onset of puberty, that's when people usually notice they, you know, that they start having migraines. Um, 
you know, it causes inflammatory changes in your body, any hormonal shift. If you think of your body as a giant, you know, machine, you have, you have chemical levels in your blood, certain things respond to certain stimuli and your hormone maybe triggers some of that CGRP, the calcitonin gene related peptide, which causes a lot of the inflammation in the meninges that causes migraines. Um, for some reason that seems to be a big trigger, especially for women. Um, you know, for me, myself, you know, I started having migraines when I was 14 ish, I had them very severely. And then I didn't have another one until I had my daughter. And then I had about five good years and now it's back. So I think, you know, different stages of life definitely can, can create different levels of migraines for you. Sure. Now, the, um, so I'm asking this more as a clinician than a, you know, as a podcast host, but at what age would I say, yeah, that's really unusual. I have a migraine at that age present presentation where I would immediately see that as a red flag. Sure. So, you know, I don't, I don't deal a lot in children, but I have heard uh, up to date, you know, age five, people have had migraines. But I think if you're under 12, 13, and you're having new onset head pain that's severe and debilitating, I think neurology is definitely something that needs to be explored to make sure there's no intracranial processes going on before, you know, it's dubbed a migraine and it requires treatment. So, and what age would you consider that, you know, somebody presents in their 62 would you would that draw you to say yeah, i better this is an age i should probably look for something other than a migraine because it's a, a late in life right right uh usually the patients i see that are later in life usually don't have new onset usually they have had it for years they've just been dealing with it there haven't been good treatment options but if someone has what we call a thunderclap headache the worst headache of their life um, and they haven't had any of these symptoms before, I would say in their fifties, sixties, definitely need to be worked up for, for neurological issues as well. Uh, most of the patients I see, they've been dealing with this all their life or okay. for, for a lot of their life. So often by the time they get to me, it, it all that's been done. Um, if someone comes to me for back pain and they have new onset migraine, definitely warrants treatment, especially in those younger and older populations. Now, we, we in the opening, I made reference to the phases. Mm -hmm. and I know migraines have kind of four distinct phases. You want to walk us through those phases just so people can understand that concept? Sure. So there's the prodrome, the aura the actual migraine and then the postdrome. So the prodrome is usually, you know, it can be 72 hours before you have a migraine. Um, you know, people just, something's not right. I'm feeling anxious, my mood is low, I'm extremely fatigued. Constipation can be, you know, part of the prodrome. Um, unusual food cravings. It almost sounds a little PMSy, but really, it can be related to to migraines. <laughs> um, so you, that's your prodrome phase. A lot of people don't recognize that phase because there's no pain associated with it. And the aura, if they have auras, because you can have migraines with or without auras, but the aura is the next phase, and that's when people are like, "Oh gosh, yes, a migraine is coming on." Um, and that can be sensitivity to light, noise, sound. It can be the pre presence of uh, spots, floaters, um, visual cut, field cuts. Um, sometimes people smell things that aren't there. It's a very specific smell that they smell, so olfactory. Or they can have, you know, some tinnitus or ringing in the ears. And then they know, okay, this is happening I need to maybe start looking at treatment options. Um, some people also will have some numbness tingling in their arm, face, neck, um, and that, that can signify migraine as well. Then the pain hits and that can last anywhere from a few hours to a few days. It depends on the patient. And the pain's usually the unilateral. Most people know their pathway. It starts back here, it comes here, or, 
it comes up and around my head and then they are out of commission. They have to sit in a dark room. They can't go to work. They, they have trouble caring for their children. It's very, very debilitating. Um, and then there's the postdrome, which is kind of like the pre-drome. It wraps up the whole cycle. People, it's almost like a post-ictal after a seizure where you're feeling just kind of foggy, um, tired, anxious, any of those things that happen in the pre-drum can happen in the post-drum as well. So I guess I, we probably should all premise this by saying people should still seek symptoms if they think they're having a stroke, but why don't yes. you talk about how migraines can mimic a stroke? Yes. So there's something called a hemiplegic migraine where people will actually have one side of their body that is weakened. Um, it's associated with the migraine pathway that they have and usually is accompanied by the severe pain. Um, usually those patients, if that if that's a new onset thing and it's not normal for them, I definitely recommend people going and getting evaluated in the emergency department because a stroke, you know, it's not something you want to put off. It can be something that's life-threatening or purely right, life-changing. Um, after, you know, you've been worked up and you know there's nothing going on in there, but you notice every time you get this pain, you know, you get numbness and tingling down your right side, you know that that is part of your migraine process. So, so in any time that that changes, definitely seeking out care is very important. Absolutely. Now, could you kind of walk the listeners through a, a first visit for someone that may have migraines? I mean, how? How do you, what happens? Sure. So usually people will come to me. Um, they have been kind of complacent with just this is something I'm going to deal with. And I guess this is just how it's going to be. Um, so I'll meet the patient. I'll talk to them about their symptoms, how long it's been going on. I always ask very specific questions. How many migraine days in the past 30 days? Um, how many severe debilitating where you were, you know, out of commission. And then this, this question is always kind of eye opening for patients. How many days are you completely head pain free in, in a month? And they'll sit there and think about it. And they'll say, mm, I'm never head pain free. And that indicates to me that they really, really have been, you know, suffering and they're not living their best life, obviously. They're not living well. Yeah. So prophylaxis in that that instance is is warranted. I will also usually before you arrive, if I have the records, I'll go through and see all the medications that they have tried, failed. Um, I'll ask about any side effects with medications, if sensitivities um, and also what they do for work and you know what what their responsibilities in life are, because we definitely don't want to prescribe something that's going to cause them to have difficulty completing tasks, enjoying life, anything of that nature. So, you know, just kind of getting to know a patient and knowing what their needs are is very, very important in our first visit. Okay. Um, what is, we talked about the treatment. What are some of the medications that are used to treat? Sure. So it's really, really exciting because prior to the past year or two, um, there's been very little new developments in the migraine world and they come with a lot of risks. So triptans usually were the, the mainstay and most people who take those have quite a bit of side effect. If they take it, it doesn't always take all the pain away or um, they have cardiovascular risk factors, which could result in death, heart attack and death. It's a, it's, it's a very fine line. Um, and honestly, if you take it, oftentimes you're out for the day. It, it has a high sedation side effect for some people. Um, now we have medications that work directly on the CGRP, which is the inflammatory mediator of most migraines they found. Not all of them, but most of them. Um, and those are very well tolerated, um, very little side effect, no cardiovascular risks with it. No vasoconstriction. That's that's the big thing with triptans. It causes the vasoconstriction and can right, cause right. heart attack. Um, there, 
There's also the prophylactic monoclonal antibodies that you are injecting once a month or once every three months. And that has been very, very successful for my patients. Um, I've, I've started quite a few people on those and they haven't had a migraine since. Um, sometimes we do a mixture of those two just to, to, you know, so in case they have breakthrough, they can use an, a rescue medication. Um, we do trigger point injection. We do Botox injections for migraine. Um, we also, you know, occipital nerve blocks, if it's stemming from the occipital area, is, is helpful. Well, then that leads to my next question. What acupuncture always comes up? Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, acupuncture and tr trigger point or dry needling um, kind of do a lot of the same things, but right. they the outcome is different. What we're looking to do is different. Acupuncture, a lot of times, is energy work. We're looking to redirect things. Dry needling is an amazing thing for patients, especially with that really, really tight scalp and shoulder area. Um, it's just, you know, it's kind of like acupuncture. It's like a little needle. They tap in, find that point. You're, you'll kind of spasm up, and then it releases. It, it gives it that satisfaction so that it can release. And that tends to last a lot longer than than many other modalities, especially if with a lot of tension. Um, trigger point injection is a very small needle. We use uh, long acting lidocaine to help relax that muscle and also um, block the pain. Um, often I have patients that come in every four to six weeks and they do very well with that. Um, you know, if the barometric pressure changes, I tend to see more patients because about two days before a storm comes in, I was very volatile with that. And so it's right. not, not a great place for, for pain patients. Um, but I'll see people about two days before the weather changes and we'll do a bunch of injections and then they, they do better. So what about the patients? What are the treatment options? Or maybe you could answer how often you see this, mm -hmm. that it's just a chronic headache, but it's not a migraine. What, 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 are, what happens to those patients? Very so I know that I understand, you know, from experience. Absolutely. So chronic headache usually has a migraine related, you know, indication or etiology. Um, it's not normal to have head pain every single day. I have found that a lot of patients who do have daily headaches that aren't, you know, they don't have any associated symptoms that a migraine would have with like nausea, vomiting, the sensitivities, anything to the, of that nature. Um, I find that I'll ask them, have you been in a car accident in your past where you've had a whiplash incident? And almost, I'd say 99% of patients would be like, yeah, I did. It was a really bad accident, but it was 30 years ago. I said, when did your your pain start. And they're like, well, probably about a year or two after that. So a lot of my patients will have um, something called cervical dystonia with the head pain. So a lot of times the headache pain medicines are not helping. So if we take care of the dystonia, then it allows the other medications to work better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there, it, it, it Kind of like inflammatory bowel. There's kind of a spectrum. Yes. A continuum that people might present on. So Whitney, I know that you and Dr. Matthew and your colleagues up there have a full service uh, pain clinic and mm -hmm. have, and we just, we, we did a podcast with Dr. Matthew here recently, but tell, tell me why, why, how'd you get interested in migraines? You mentioned earlier that you had them. Uh, yes. Was that part of the motivation? Absolutely. So I have suffered from migraines and daily head and neck pain for most of my life. And it, I have been to my primary cares. I've been to neurologists and they're like, you just need to reduce your stress. There wasn't a really a good option for me to get relief. Um, and stemming from that, I never really felt heard a lot of the time. So being able to give people and understand the process and how that affects your life made me really, really interested in specializing in this. Um, it's something I understand. It's something I go through. I, you know, I know usually if I'm recommending something, I've tried it myself. 
So it's something I'm really passionate about because I know so many people that have migraines and they suffer in silence often, you know, obviously the first two medications didn't work and it just seems like there's nothing that can be done. Um, migraines are actually the second leading cause of disability right behind back pain. So it's super prevalent. Um, so it's definitely needed here in Iowa and across the nation. So I figure, you know, I understand it. I, I can empathize with you. Um, so I, I want to help. Well, I think the, 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 the next step is how does someone get referred to your clinic? How, do, how can listeners get help? Sure. So um, if, if your insurance requires it, you can get a referral from your primary care. Or you can call our office and ask, you know, can I, I, I'd like to be seen for migraines and ask for an appointment with me. They'll, they'll usually get you in with the first two weeks. So it's pretty, pretty quick. We can get you relief pretty quick. Um, usually, what is, that, what is that phone number? It is 319-369-7331. There's a couple options. Um, so if you listen for Dr. Matthew, my name, push that button, it'll get you to the secretaries that will help schedule. Well, that's great to know. That's good, not only for the patients, but also for the thousands and thousands of uh, primary care physicians that listen to this podcast uh, each each time. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, bring them, bring them to me. I'm ready. All right, Whitney. Hey, Whitney, thanks for joining me today. Once again, that was uh, Whitney Hankin, nurse practitioner at St. Luke's Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. For more information, visit unipoint.org. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Live Well Talk On. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your family, friends, neighbors, strangers about our podcast. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcast. Until next time, be well.